we'll get started. Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. And today we're very happy to have uh, Mr. Lafayette here from uh, DigiLab and as well as various other companies um, that he has founded. So uh, Mr. Lafayette, uh, welcome and how are you? Oh, hi. Thank you. I'm, I'm very well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Then let's jump right into it. So first of all, actually, what is your uh, background and uh, how did it influence your decision to start, start DigiLab? For instance, uh, why did you choose to get a Bachelor of Commerce at Concordia? Yeah, so my background is, uh, is I guess, entrepreneurship. I've always been an entrepreneur since... Uh, since probably, you know, last few years of high school, I'm guessing. Uh, I didn't really know back then uh, what it was to be an entrepreneur, but I, have, I had the drive to, 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 you know, to undertake projects and to, to, to build projects. And by then it was more projects than companies. But um, so I was always also like interested in business. So I decided to go, you know, study business administration at university. I come from a high school that uh, is a French speaking, I guess you can tell by my accent, but uh, it was important for me to study in English just to kind of, you know, obviously learn about, you know, learn, like improve uh, my English, but also make new acquaintances with, uh, you know, new people from, from different backgrounds. So yeah, I decided to go to JMSB uh, at Concordia University, study business administration, I started in finance, uh, and I really like. I'm a, I'm a numbers guy. I always, you know, liked finance, but uh, I had great, great grades uh, in, in the first few fine, uh, like the the basic finance courses. But quickly realized that uh, you know, going up into like the, the more difficult finance courses, that uh, it wasn't for me, just because it was mostly meant to be for like a, I think someone who wants to become a CFA, for example. And as a you know entrepreneur looking to launch different startups you don't really touch the higher, more difficult finance stuff. So I decided to switch to marketing and then uh, it was uh, a bit easier, more like smooth sailing until the end of, uh, of my bachelor's degree. And I actually co-founded a company during my university years called Oatbox. Uh, Oatbox's mission was to help uh, people eat, be- eat breakfast every day, eat a healthy breakfast because it's you know half of the North American population that don't, don't eat breakfast every day. So we were shipping, actually the companies, they are shipping uh, breakfast products all over North America. They now sell also healthy breakfast products that they manufacture themselves in different grocery stores. So that was, that was Oatbox. And then, uh, and then obviously, so first entrepreneurial experience, really liked it. Then I uh, co-founded a baby, a baby products company that didn't work, was a kind of a failure, uh, but uh, a great failure from which I've learned a lot. And uh, it led me to co-found uh, Ditch. And uh, I started working on the project it's in September 2019, and we co-founded the company in January 2020. Yeah, well, actually, I'm very surprised you actually co-founded uh, Outbox during your university years. But before that, uh, you, you talk about you were becoming more of an entrepreneur during your high school years. So uh, what uh, is there any childhood event that inspired you, you to be an entrepreneur? From what I remember, no, not specifically. I come, my, my, my father is, uh, has always, you know, worked in, in business, I guess, all his life. He started his career, actually started his career in, in, in uh, management consulting, then uh, touched a bit of politics as well. And then, and then you know, was m- mostly advising technology companies uh on the business side so you know i guess i guess there's some sort of influence that came from there uh my mom as well worked in different uh uh, marketing agencies she worked at cassette a really big agency in canada so i guess i was influenced a bit by you know marketing business and when i look back at my at my um at my uh, well humble achievements so far i kind of see a trend where it's the mix of, of marketing design also my sister's a graphic designer my other sister's an interior designer so my my, my brother I, I come from a family of four kids but my brother works at ubisoft so very creative now he's more on the management side but still a very creative uh, company so we come from like a creative slash business family so i guess that 
you know, creativity and business is pretty much what entrepreneurship is all about. So I guess it influenced me, but I couldn't say there's one specific event that happened that, you know, triggered something. I guess it's more also being a bit of a rebel growing up. Um, I went to private high school, but always had a bit of trouble with the authority. Uh, I played, uh, I played uh, hockey. So I was, you know, interested in sports and I was, I guess, excited a bit for a very serious private school. Uh, and that I think led me to, to kind of question if I wanted, you know, someone else to dictate my career or I wanted to, you know, take it in my own hands and, and uh, achieve what I want to achieve personally. So, Okay, then, then talking about your achievement and so first of all it's Oldbox which is uh, was very successful and is still very successful uh, so how was your experience co-founding Oldbox and most importantly what gave you an idea to be a student and simultaneously just decide to launch this uh, company that's now really North American wide that's delivering oatmeal boxes yeah um, I guess there's a bit of uh, of luck or uh it's just yeah it's just a a mix of circumstances i, I was studying at jmsb by, by back then and i got approached by someone a, a few years older than me his name is marc antoine beauvais uh and he approached me because i was doing a bit of like design work i was kind of a freelance designer back then i, I learned you know graphic design from my sister how to how to navigate the uh, different softwares like Illustrator and Photoshop. And I was doing a bit of like freelance design just to kind of pay off uh, whatever a student buys, like pay off my, my nights at the bar and uh, a few restaurants here and there. But um, uh, yeah, I was doing some freelance design stuff. And uh, Marc Antoine approached me. He's, uh, he's also an entrepreneur. He co-founded a company called Golf Avenue. He sell uh, golf clubs online. And um, oh, golf, golf equipment, not just golf clubs, but um, very successful company. And he approached me. He needed some, some like design work uh, for Golf Avenue. So that's how I started working with Marc Antoine. And obviously with his co-founder as well at Golf Avenue, uh, Pierre-Luc. And um, I remember saying to Marc Antoine whenever he approached me uh, for a design, you know, a, a very specific design mandate, I told Marc Antoine, like, look, I'll, 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 work, I'll work for you guys. But... Uh, I want you to keep in mind that I, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I, you know, I'm obviously still in school, but I eventually want to launch a business. So this is not going to last like a long time. You know, it's, I'm going to work for you again. I'll do the design mandate, maybe a few, a few other mandates, but that's it. And he told me like, Laura, we're entrepreneurs too. We like to launch businesses. You know, we like to work on different projects. Come work for us. Who knows what it, where it will lead us. And actually six months later, I think we were working on Notebox. And another six months later, so probably a year after I started working with Marc Antoine and Pierre Lick, we launched Oatbox. So, uh, and I was, uh, you know, I co-founded the company with uh, with these two and a, a developer that worked at uh, uh, Golf Avenue. So we were four co-founders. So it's just, you know, different circumstances, I guess, that brought the opportunity and we seized it as a group. Okay, then... Uh, how did you, your experience, especially as a group co-founding Oldbox, influence your later entrepreneurial journey? Wow. Um, I mean, <laughs> like you always remember your first, right? So it's, a, it's, the first, it's the first, you know, official incorporated company that, that I launched personally. So it's a very, it's a very uh, introspective question. It influenced me, obviously. I think to, what I learned from it is kind of the, everyone says always like, you know, just launch the company. Like, don't think about it too much. Like, the, the most important thing is to is to start. You know, it's not to to have the perfect idea, the perfect project, whatever. The most important thing is just to start. And I think I really understood the meaning of that with that company. Didn't quite. I, I'm a kind of a, kind of a perfectionist, so I was always, you know, looking for the perfect solution, the perfect uh, the perfect problem to solve, uh, the perfect product, the perfect co-founders, the perfect, you know, uh, economical setting. That never happened. It's really even the most important thing is to start, and that that I think influenced me, especially um, 
with ditch like the the ditch idea really evolved through time and i think just the fact that we just started the company and yeah i think that's how it influenced me basically just to just to, to, to push me to start okay um then uh was there any reason for you to leave the company after its success uh yeah yeah for sure that is you know i stayed there for two and a half years um i was a a minority co-founder so uh, two of the co-founders had uh, a majority stake in the company and like i mentioned with my background being a bit of a rebel uh, i like to i like to lead projects i like i like to um i like to develop my own vision uh not that i'm not uh, able to work with anyone obviously you know, my co-founder and I and uh, at Ditch were very much aligned, and we challenge each other, and, and it's, it's a great, it's a great partnership. Um, I think at Oatbox, there were just too many cooks in the kitchen, being four co-founders, three of the four co-founders being you know business oriented. Yeah, just too many cooks in the kitchen, basically, and uh, you know, eventually, I think that it, it was kind of clear that I wanted to do something else. I, I had kind of learned what I needed to learn from that project and I wanted to move on. And it was, it was, you know, my other co-founders kind of agreed to, and they've been, um, they were actually really, really supportive and, uh, really classy in the way they approached it and the way they accepted it. And, uh, we split ways and actually they, they bought back, uh, they offered to buy back my shares. So I, I was able to, I guess for myself, either financially or even, you know, publicly say, you know, it was somewhat of a success. So, so it's, it's something I'm still proud of, uh, to this day, but it's, yeah, it's made, basically, I think co-founder, it's very tough, right? Like co-founding a startup is, uh, it's, it's very difficult on human relationships. It's very stressful. It's, um, there's a lot of passion involved as well. So. It, it happens a lot where different paths uh, kind of astray. And um, I, I think it's the most important thing is just to recognize it and to embrace it and not to be afraid and to stay respectful. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. So. Okay. Uh, well, sounds like a perfect legitimate reason for leaving a company if, yeah, some things doesn't work out or you feel like you learned enough. Yeah. It's never easy, though. It's never easy. Yeah, it's never easy. It's like, um, you know, especially the first company, I'm guessing. Now that I've done it, you know, leaving a company I, I, I co-founded, I guess uh, I, I guess I could do it again. Not that I really want to, because now I'm extremely satisfied with where I'm at. But uh, uh, you learn a lot. Uh, but it's it's still, I think it's still something very difficult because you get attached to the company. You get attached to the people there. You get attached to... Uh, your vision even for the company and you kind of have to let all that go. Uh, and it's not like you're leaving a company to, you know, launch a competitor to that company or anything, you know, you're kind of leaving the industry as well. And uh, it, it's tough. It's never easy, but uh, sometimes it's, it's for the better. It's a bit like a relationship, right? It's a bit like a, there's a lot of similarities to, to, to either friendship or love in, in entrepreneurship. Yeah. Okay. Um, then perfect legitimate reason, perfectly fine answers, um, actually more than adequate answers. And, uh, I will hand it to Camilla to talk a bit about, uh, other questions. Perfect. Thank you, Henry. Um, so we heard that Oatbox wasn't the only, um, company that you founded early on. In fact, we heard that you also founded another company called Bomb Bomb. Um, could you tell us a little bit about this company? and um, how it came about? Yeah, sure. So uh, Bomb Bomb was a completely different project. It was kind of a spin-off of a, a, a company that already existed, but that wasn't doing really well. Uh, it was a company called Everyday Happy. They, they, they were selling baby products, like organic baby products, eco-friendly baby products. A bit like was kind of a copy of uh, The Honest Company, which is uh, Jessica Alba's company. So the company needed like a uh, needed you know guidance uh, direction needed a rebranding. 
So that's where I took over the company. And uh, there was an investor involved that stayed uh, invested into the company and, and actually put more money in. And we rebranded the company, refocused the product line around, you know, the most successful product uh, and kind of did a, you know, wanted to do a, a new launch for the new brand. But uh, when we had, uh, we had major issues with our supplier, we had suppliers overseas uh, that manufactured, uh, especially our diapers. and. Uh, Diapers are very, very, it's a very, very, very tough business. Uh, it's a, it's a loss leader. So usually, you know, big companies like Procter and Gamble who own the uh, Pampers, for example, uh, they'll, uh, they'll use Pampers as a way to attract a mom into a grocery store, a pharmacy or a superstore, uh, to, um, to then sell other products like Tide or like other high margin products. So um, they're called, those products are called loss leaders. So it's very, very tough to build a diaper business uh, when you're competing against loss leaders and big companies that have other brands and other products that they could sell to kind of recuperate the, the loss. Uh, so we've learned that the hard way, uh, but especially, you know, having problems with our suppliers overseas, not getting the product in time, uh, the whole relationship of building a product, uh, a consumer product, especially a baby product, which is kind of, you know, I wouldn't say regulated because now I'm, I'm in the medical industry, which is extremely regulated, but it's still, it abides by very strict standards. Uh, that was that was really, really tough. So the, we actually never received the product, ran out of money, investors didn't want to put in more money. So we had to close the company and, uh, and, uh, you know, take our losses and uh, and uh, yeah. So that was a that was a tough experience, but I learned a lot again from that. I see. Thank you so much for your very um, detailed answer. Um. So, what turned out to be the fate of um Bomb Bomb as of right now? Oh, so yeah, the, the company doesn't exist anymore. Uh, yeah, we just closed down the company, and that's it. So, unfortunately, I don't even know if uh, if the company ever received uh, <laughs> the actual purchase order for all the diapers uh, overseas. I think it didn't because we needed to pay uh, the supplier in order to get them. So I think the investor, uh, uh, which was basically the only investor, I think he just, uh, uh, like I mentioned, took his loss and that's it. Um, then if, I'll, if it's all right, um, may I ask if, um, although it must have been a, a bit of like a bittersweet experience, um, did it help you learn a lot when it comes to being an entrepreneur? And was your other projects going forward? Yeah, I think it. Um, if I can make it like, not a parallel, but a link to to Oatbox. Um, Oatbox we were like four, like super, like we were four young, like very driven co-founders with a, I'd say, a limited budget. So we kind of, you know, built the company in a very, uh, I wouldn't say frugal, but in a very, you know safe way in terms of, of money management and two of the co-founders had actually invested most of the money their own money so we were very careful uh whereas bomb bomb i think i've kind of i've, I've kind of took the old box experience and i i said oh you know it, it doesn't require that much money to start a company basically if you bootstrap it and you know you, you go slowly but in the in the cpg industry the, the consumer packaged goods uh, it's really not the same strategy. And I kind of applied the same strategy, I think, in terms of the funds that were required to, to launch a company like that. And uh, that was, a, that was a, a, it's a big mistake because, you know, to, <laughs> there's actually, since then, there's another company that launched with um, another celebrity uh, being the, um, the, the, the brand, like the image of the company, uh, Kristen Bell. Kristen Bell and, and her husband. And uh, I think they invested, before launch, they invested like $15 million in marketing or something. So like we were running on like $300,000 budget and we had with that budget, we needed to like order the products and stuff. So it was a very, very like small budget compared to what's needed, I think nowadays to launch a, a new CPG company, especially in the baby space, which is already crowded. So I think that was the biggest, uh, the, the biggest thing that came out of that was uh, every company is different, every industry is different. And you kind of need to redo a whole evaluation 
and a new strategy in order to adapt. Thank you again for your answer. Um, and on that note, actually, um, so you've actually experienced working in quite a number of different industries. And um, how was your experience working as an entrepreneur in so many different industries? Um, what were some key lessons that you yourself took away from those experiences altogether? Yeah, good question. I think um, I'm, I'm really happy actually about the, the way I started working let's say in a, in a I, not easier industry because we were still in like food. This food is also kind of regulated and we're manufacturing our own product. So uh, that was kind of complicated, but I wasn't touching that. So I was touching more on the marketing side for Oatbox. And um, yeah, I think what I like about my progression into different industries is that I think they became more and more complex. And um, that's something that personally, as an entrepreneur, I really appreciate the complexity behind uh, a certain industry or a certain product because what I love is to learn. And I, I could not just, um, I could not just like launch right now. I could, I could when I was younger, but I, I could not launch, let's say now, just like, a, I don't know, a, a, I look around, <laughs> I'm in my room right now. So I'm like, oh, a, a sock company, like do socks and sell them online. I would not learn as much as, let's say, ditch now that I learn about, you know, regulatory process for a medical device. I learn about the pharmaceutical industry. Um, it's all, I learned even, you know, about psychology, about uh, pharmacology, about medicine, uh, addiction treatment. It's, it, they're all very, very, very complex industries or problems. And I, I just, I just find it very stimulating. Yeah, I guess that's, that's, that's what I'm looking for. And that's my, my, my lesson is to, you know, start simple. But uh, for me as an entrepreneur, it's, it's, I, I love to add complexity as I go. And uh, I think that the current industry I'm in will always surprise me and will always, you know, um, allow me to learn and learn more because it's so complex and it's so it touches so many spheres of sciences and, and just human behavior in general. That's indeed a very interesting answer. Thank you so much. Um, I'll now pass it back to Henry, who's going to go deeper into your current project, Ditch. Yeah, uh, speaking of Ditch, so uh, we look around the website. It's um, It seems so, and from my own understanding, I, I think it's uh, a company that helps with nicotine addiction. So uh, first of all, why did you start this company uh, in the first place? Yeah, so... Funny enough, actually, I could, I could, I could also make a link with Oatbox. Uh, it, it's easier, obviously, in hindsight now, like seeing Oatbox and saying, okay, well, you know, they want to bring healthy breakfast products to the market because, you know, people don't eat breakfast every day. Um, healthy breakfast options are somewhat limited. Like healthy, easy breakfast options are somewhat limited. And the whole even vision, I think, was to, like, I, I'd love to have, like, even not like fast food chains, but I, I, we were kind of envisioning like, what if like everywhere there was a McDonald's, there was also a, a restaurant where you could, you know, drive by to, in the drive through and get a, a healthy breakfast on the go uh, on the way to work or something. We would, I think, improve the, um, the, the, the rate at which people eat breakfast every day and um, improve health in general. And it's easy to see it in hindsight, but like when we were building old box, we, like the initial idea was just like, I think it started from one of the co-founders saying, yeah, my, my, uh, my sister's baking her own granola at her place. And it's like much better than anything that's on the grocery store shelves. Uh, the ingredients are healthier and like the taste is just better. So like, why don't we, don't, why don't we like, kind of use the same process as what my sister uh, does at home, but like we package it and we mass market it. So that was the initial idea. So. It wasn't at all about like helping people eat breakfast every day. And I think we kind of struggled, you know, I hope they don't struggle anymore. But uh, I, I think when I was at Old Box back in like 2015, uh, we were kind of struggling finding our why. Like, why do we do that? And like, we're not just selling a product. Like, what's the core value of the company and what problem are we solving? So uh, so that that's kind of the the initial spark, I guess, that for me was, it got more and more important through my, 
entrepreneurial development to start focusing on huge problems instead of focusing on solution. And uh, we usually say like, be passionate about the problem. Don't be passionate about the solution or else you'll, you'll fail. Like you need to adapt to a problem, not you need to develop a solution to a problem. And if the, the problem doesn't require that solution anymore, you need to pivot to solve that problem again. So at, at Ditch, basically, I was looking at, um, after the, the bomb bomb failure, I'd say, I was uh, looking at different problems around me and trying not to think about solutions, obviously. And the biggest, most obvious problem was friends coming over for dinner at, at my place and they were juuling, actually, they were vaping. Uh, and I was like, "Whoa, man, you, you've never smoked before, and, and you're, you know, you're vaping. That's kind of kind of weird to me. Like, the, you know, my best friend or whatever is vaping, and I've never seen him hold a cigarette in his life, you know." And he's like, "Yeah, man, I'm addicted now." So it's like, "Wow, that's a huge problem, obviously." And he he, he was telling me like, "Oh, I want to quit. Uh, I don't really know what to do." And uh, I think the next time I saw him, he went to buy nicotine gum at the pharmacy. So nicotine gum to, to, to treat with cra- treat cravings and to help with the smoking cessation. And I read the packaging and everywhere on the packaging was written, like if you're a, a, obviously an adult smoker who smokes more than 25 cigarettes per day, take uh, this uh, nicotine concentration or take this product, take this uh, strength. If you're smoking 15 to 25 cigarettes a day, take that strength. And I was like, well, how will a, 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 a young person who struggles with a vaping addiction will recognize themselves into that product, like into that packaging? It's, it's everywhere. It's, it, it's targeted to smokers. Uh, so that's where like the initial spark came about. And um, then I became passionate about the problem. Then I started researching, you know, what is nicotine addiction? Uh, how many smokers there are, how big is the market, uh, everything related to nicotine addiction. I started reading scientific uh, literature also on the treatment of nicotine addiction. And the initial idea, like the solution with you know, not much, not, mo- not a lot of information was to create some sort of nicorette, but branded for a younger audience uh, who are struggling with vaping addiction, not necessarily uh, cigarette addiction, like not necessarily smoking. So that's, that's the initial idea. Uh, but then kind of realized that um, Nicorette products, uh, you know, they work to beat cravings here and there. If you're, you're a heavy smoker and you want to, uh, you have a, um, uh, you're traveling let's say, to Europe and you're on, you're going to be on the plane for seven, eight hours. Uh, you're going to buy a Nicorette gum just to manage your cravings on the, on the plane ride. But it's not the best product out there to treat the nicotine addiction altogether. Uh, and actually started reading about the potential that vaping devices have to uh, get rid of a nicotine addiction and, and, you know, very reputable studies. And yeah, that's kind of the evolution of the idea. I say, well, okay, well, Nicorette doesn't really work. Why would I brand uh, a Nicorette product basically differently if it's not the best solution out there to treat the nicotine addiction? My my goal is to treat nicotine addiction. It's not to it's not to, to replace nicotine with a safer form of nicotine. And um, basically, the, the the idea evolved, and um, I it's pretty crazy, but it was a. I remember it being December twenty seventh, two thousand nineteen, and I woke up at like five thirty in the morning. Uh, I, I I just had a dream of like I was talking to doctors, anything. I was explaining an idea, and I I wrote on my cell phone the exact idea that ditch is now it's like a it's a vaping device because it has potential in terms of like what what's included in the scientific literature that has potential to treat a nicotine addiction but it's a bad it's badly designed it's actually has potential to have to have smokers switch from a traditional cigarette to a vaping device but it's badly designed to help a smoker get rid of the addiction altogether so i kind of woke up during the night and i I, it was like a eureka moment like oh my god this is the product we need. It's a vaping device, but that automatically weans the user off nicotine. And that's basically how the idea came about. And I think it fits with the problem we're trying to solve. Okay. So after you came out with this uh, actually quite ingenious idea, now I think about it, a vaping device that helps to treat nicotine addiction. Um, how how did you start um, producing the, pr- uh, the product itself? And how did you acquire funding more uh, importantly? 
Yeah, so um, we joined uh, we joined an incubator called Centec. Um, Centec is affiliated with uh, uh, ETS, it's École de Technologie Supérieure, in Montreal, uh, and they have a very strong cohort of medical device companies. Uh, there, we are uh, supported by an entrepreneur in residence. They call him. It's a his name is Stephen Arliss. He, you know founded many many medical companies in his life i think i think the actual number is like seven he's actually launched an eighth company right now and he has a few very successful exits he sold one of the companies for 400 million to medtronic he has like all the the experience that i think we needed for our product so yeah we 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 joined the uh, centec came with a bit of like what we call non-dilutive funding so it's either grants or uh, sometimes like loans. Uh, we don't have loans personally. We only went to get grants. So Centec came with about fifty thousand dollars of uh, non-dilutive funding, uh, meaning also they don't take equity into the company. They just you know give you money for either a payback or just uh, just a grant. And um, yeah, so that's that was like fifty k. Then we applied to different governmental uh, programs. One of them being, if you're incubated in a recognized incubator in Quebec, you're able to apply to a, a grant called, uh, I don't know in English, but in French, it's the Bon d'Incubation. Uh, I think it's like incubation grant or something. And in the life sciences sector, they give you, you submit a project of $80,000 and they reimburse $60,000. So they reimburse 75% of the project. So we submitted, you know, different like a, uh, uh, salaries, uh, different uh, product development expenses as a project, and then uh, they reimburse 60k. But the, the the great part about that is that they pay 42,000 of the 60,000 upfront before you even incur the expenses. So you're able to finance uh, your way like that with different different programs, and that's what we've done for a year i'd say before starting fundraising so we were able to live off that obviously my co-founder and i weren't paying ourselves and we you know our, our team was kind of small at the, at the at that time so uh but that's really how we 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 were able to actually you know develop a proof of concept develop a first prototype gain a bit of traction and uh you know not risk uh either investors money or our own money into the into the project Okay, then um, coming back to your co-founder here. So um, from uh, what you just talked about, uh, it, it seems like it was more a personal journey. And then what influenced you to um, get a co-founder to found Ditch instead of just doing it alone? I, I guess it works sometimes, like starting a company alone. I guess there's certain companies or certain people that are able to do it. But um, us being only two co-founders actually was you know, speaking to different investors was actually something they brought up. Like it wasn't enough. Like we needed probably like a doctor uh, on the team as well to be a co-founder with us. Uh, so it's, you know, it's just, um, I think it was natural for me to, you know, having the kind of idea of having a vaping device that uh, treats an addiction. Uh, so, you know, a medical device, I needed someone with hardware experience, software experience, and I come from a business background. I needed someone from a tech background, an engineering background. And I reached out to Olivier, Olivier Bourbonnet, my, my co-founder. Uh, he's actually, you know, studying electrical engineering. I know he started in electrical engineering. Now he's in software engineering at ETS, Ecole de Technologie Supérieure, right next to Centec. And, uh, uh, yeah, I reached out to him. He, he's honestly the perfect partner for this project. He has also previous entrepreneurial experience. He co-founded a company called Smart Halo. Uh, they raised uh, over $2 million on Kickstarter. They do a, a navigation device for bikes. So it's like a GPS that you put on your, on the front of your bike and uh, allows you to navigate the city in a very, very you know design-oriented way. It's a beautiful device. It's, they actually sell the device in different Apple stores. So like you see kind of the link with the design and, you know, they're great devices. So he, he's a, he's the engineer behind the device who like he built, basically he built the whole technology behind the device and also take, to, took care of like manufacturing. Uh, and they were manufacturing in Quebec. They brought the manufacturing uh, operations overseas as well. So you had all that like ex amazing experience in building a device 
um, and the software also because Smart Halo is related to a mobile application and our device is related to a mobile application as well. So like it was the kind of the perfect fit. And I knew Olivier a bit like professionally. Uh, you know, we went out like every, you know, maybe every six months to grab a beer. Uh, I always respected uh, his work. I think he always respected my vision as well. So um, when I reached out to him, it was just, you know, very natural, very obvious. Took, I think, 15 minutes. He's like, Laurent, I'm in, let's go. Timing was great too. I mean, he was, uh, he was just, he got out of Smart Halo and um, I think he got out of Smart Halo like six months before or something. It was kind of looking for a new project. So timing was perfect as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, nothing influenced me to get a co-founder. I think it's really important to get a co-founder, especially like for our, our business. I could have hired, yeah, I could have hired a, product development firm or something to kind of, I would never say replace LZ because it's not replaceable, but, um, you know, to take on the work that he's doing a ditch, but it would have never been the same. Uh, and I think also just on the personal side, I love to have an, an equal partner who's, you know, always there to bounce ideas with me. It's very validating. It's very reassuring and it's honestly just the best way to scale a company quickly. If you're all alone and no one's aligned with you, like an employee is fine. Like it's, it's okay, but it's, it's really not the same as a co-founder. Like it's really not the same. Their, 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 um, their objectives are not the same. Their motivation is not the same. Their implication is not the same. So you need a co-founder and, um, yeah, that's why I went to I went to approach Olivier. Uh, yeah, makes perfect sense. And since we talk about founding, we talk about human relationships and human resources a bit between you and uh, Mr. Bourbonnet. Um, now I want to um, give it to hand it to Camilla to talk about a bit about marketing and especially how your company generates uh, revenue. Yeah. So. Um... Well, when we first did um, research on Ditch a little bit, um, we weren't too sure what the product was at first and um, how you provide the service to your customer and in return generate revenue. So do you mind walking us through that process a little bit of how your company um, generate those functions? Yeah, so uh, we actually don't generate revenue right now, uh, which is uh, we're a pre-revenue company. Um, in our in our sector, like I mentioned, medical device, pharmaceutical sector, usually what happens is um, uh, companies, you know, raise you know a few rounds of funding, probably anywhere between three to five uh, rounds of funding, to fund uh, the product development efforts as well as the regulatory efforts. So uh, we need to go through. Right now, we're in preclinical phase, so it's before our product is used in a human setting. Uh, in a clinical setting uh, by humans. So we do all, you know, lab tests, toxicity analyses, uh, dosage, precision analyses, uh, and that's going to take about a year. Then we have the clinical phase. So our product will be used by uh, patients in like the, the first phase of the pilot study. And then it'll go, it goes through, you know, phase three, which is our main uh, safety and efficacy study with, you know, over probably over 600 patients. First phase is like 50 patients. Uh, and all that is like basically you don't have any revenue. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's a bit special. It's different, but that's the way medical device companies work. And you can fund you know, all, all that development with private fundraising rounds. We are, um, we're always starting to think about it, but in terms of marketing, I think what I can say is um, since we're not selling anything right now, we're more focused on developing a dialogue with maybe potential future customers. I'll call them patients. Obviously, it's more, uh, I think it's more appropriate, but future patients. Um, so what we're kind of doing is we're actually, you know, just starting to, to post on social media and starting to write on, the, on, on our blog and stuff like that. But we're going to find, we're going to, our approach is going to be um, the whole, um, how can I say, the whole angle we chose to, to, to 
to, to take for our social media strategy and marketing strategy is focused about uh, removing the stigma around nicotine addiction because it's a very, very highly stigmatized um, problem. Uh, most, uh, well, I, I would say most people, but a lot of people in society think that uh, if you smoke, uh, it's your choice, first of all. So it's your problem, uh, not a societal problem. It's a personal problem. And uh, if you're not able to quit, it's because you're weak. It's just because, you know, you don't have willpower. And that whole stigma around nicotine addiction is, is completely wrong. And it's quite honestly very dangerous because uh, uh, smoking cigarettes is uh, the leading cause of preventable death. It kills, you know, half of all smokers will die from a tobacco-related illness. Uh, so when you think about that, it's pretty crazy to, to blame the people who use those products as being the, the only cause of their of their um, of their illness or of their of the of the danger they 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 are going through. So yeah, we want to kind of build the dialogue and change the paradigm in terms of how people view nicotine addiction, how society views nicotine addiction, and it may be eventually nicotine uh, addiction as a whole. So I think that's really interesting. It's the way we'll do marketing is, is focused on that. And that's really our core values. Uh, but we won't sell anything. So at the end of the day, it's just, you know, creating content and uh, starting to craft a story and uh, starting to build a dialogue. And eventually when we'll, you know, have, we'll have products to sell, I think it'll pay off. Um, and if I may also add, so you guys are developing a device um, a vaping device that will help cure nicotine addiction um so how is development going um with regards to that um product yeah so we're um we just developed a what we called an alpha product it's an, a prototype like a, a, a first prototype uh, it looks exactly the same as the final product that will be used uh, by uh, by our patients when we launch, but it's you know 3D printed. The whole electronic side inside the, inside the device is uh, is final, but um, I'd say the outer shell of the device is 3D printed. It's not ready for mass manufacturing, but it's with that device that we're you know ongoing preclinical studies, so lab tests, and with the result of those lab tests, we'll kind of iterate the prototype a bit just to change a few things here and there. And then we have what we call the design freeze, which will come probably in, uh, we're estimating it at nine months from now. Um, and at that point, you can't change anything in, in the device and you manufacture a small batch of, uh, of devices, uh, probably somewhere like around like 100 to 200 units. And those units will be used in the first phase of clinical trial. But yeah, right now we're still prototype. We're still, you know, printing different parts of the device with our 3d printer at the office it's still a very uh, like a one by one not a one by one but yeah but like a one by one process like we it's still very slow and and it's just because that's the way we iterate the, the the product for now i see thank you for your answer and um um actually we saw on the website uh, you guys mentioned the use of technology. So how is Stitch incorporating technology into its product or methodology of um, achieving this goal? Yeah, so technology is basically in everything we do. Um, I'll try to make this uh, easy to, to understand because it's, it's a very, very mm -hmm. complex product that we've built. Uh, I mean, the user won't... Uh, won't notice how complex it is, but uh, it has a lot of, you know, different moving parts. So first of all, we have the hardware device. Uh, it's a medical nicotine vaporizer. Uh, the technology is, you know, somewhat similar to an electronic cigarette, but we're bringing that technology in the medical world. So uh, we're able to, first of all, limit the toxicity. So we control the heat created by the device very precisely. Uh, to make sure that we don't go above certain toxicity thresholds because toxicity is created by heat. So the lower the heat, the lower the toxicity. The only problem is the lower the heat, it's also the lower uh, the nicotine level in the vapor that's uh, inhaled by the user. So yeah, our technology is able to control the heat very precisely. So we're also able to dose the nicotine very precisely. 
And the device tracks basically everything. So it, it tracks the amount of nicotine you receive. It tracks uh, everything about your consumption. So uh, let's say the time between inhalation, uh, the time of day at which the inhalation takes place. So is it you know early in the morning? Is it during the night? All those, um, um, all that information tells a lot about the person's addiction. Uh, let's say someone who wakes up during the night to to consume nicotine is is uh, much like sh- has a stronger addiction than someone that consumes a lot of nicotine, but let's say only does three times a week. Uh, it's a very it, I wouldn't say stronger, but I'd say it's a different approach to treating that uh, specific addiction. Uh, so our device is able to basically track everything and dose precisely. So that's our device. Then we have our mobile application. Uh, our mobile application is obviously the kind of the software part that uh, collects the data. There's also, we're developing in-house uh, what we call our onboarding questionnaire. So every user who will start using our uh, our product will have to go through an onboarding questionnaire. It's 55 questions, so it's very exhaustive. And uh, that questionnaire is developed in-house by our, our Christelle Luce. She's our uh, clinical psychologist. She specializes in the treatment of, uh, of nicotine addiction. And uh, our research team, spearheaded by Christelle, developed a questionnaire. And that really allows us to have you know, the psychological data. So understand uh, how every user's addiction is unique on a psychological level. Uh, is really the goal of that uh, of that questionnaire, and also you know flag uh, different um, potential problems that would uh, come up with the consumption. Let's say someone who has COPD or or different other medical problems that would uh, maybe uh, refrain the user from using our device or stuff like that. But I, I think the bigger goal is really the psychological data and the understanding of the addiction, and also that data plus the consumption data, we can adapt what we call the psychological supports or the behavioral support in the mobile application. So we have different modules in the application that say by the consumption data, we're kind of able, we're able to detect if the user's consuming more nicotine than it should, than a, he or she should. So we're also able to detect cravings even before the user knows it has a craving. And we're able to address that in the application using, uh, let's say, breathing exercises to kind of battle and, uh, and uh, overcome craving uh, instead of, you know, addressing craving with more nicotine. Technically, we're, we're able to address a craving with uh, behavioral support. Uh, and lastly, I'd say the other, you know, big part is the artificial intelligence. So uh, I think it's I kind of separated from the software because it's just much more powerful. It's what we do with all that data and how our solution will improve over time in the recommendation either of different exercises on the mobile application or on um, the optimization of uh, the nicotine reduction protocol. But also, our device reduces the nicotine through time so that the, a, a patient will do 12 to 24 weeks to get rid of the addiction, and it will reduce on 12 to 24 weeks depending on, on the, the user's uh, addiction but uh, um, uh, that's all controlled for now it's controlled by you know a very simple treatment protocol but eventually we'd like the artificial intelligence to come in and adapt the treatment in real time uh, depending on the user uh, on, on the psychological data consumption data or even user feedback in real time if the user says well you know i'm very nervous this week uh, i have you know something big coming up or um, I'm, I'm stressed about something or i you know, I lost a family member or whatever. Uh, we'd like to, the treatment to be able to adapt in real time to those situations uh, in order, you know, obviously to optimize the chances of success. Thank you so much. That was a very insightful answer. And um, just before I pass it back to Henry, um, I'm just really curious because you clearly have a background in business. Um, you yourself are you're an amazing entrepreneur um but this Thank project you. you're um, developing it's very um science based and like very like science heavy and centered um so have you always been partly interested in science or was this like a newfound interest that you came across when trying to develop this project yeah 
Yeah, great question. I, I, I was always interested for sure. But again, coming back to what I said earlier, coming from a you know creative slash business family, I don't come from a scientific family at all. So I, I, I was always interested, but I, I don't think I've ever thought of applying or using science in entrepreneurship, at least at my, in my early days of, of entrepreneurship. But it became you know, more and more clear that in, in, you know, in today's age, if you want to solve a big problem, it's probably going to be science. that's going to solve it, you know? So so I'm still struggling to this day, honestly, to like understand everything that we're doing, but that's, uh, that's, uh, that's because I think uh, somewhere my strength is to, is to build a team. And I like to hire people that are smarter than me. I like, hire people that you know are experts in, in in their field and i don't need to understand everything that they understand i just need to understand enough uh, and that for me is, is is really fascinating and yeah i just i wouldn't do another project right now that's not science based just because like i mentioned i like to learn and it's the, the fact that i keep on learning is the fact that i, I stay stimulated and i stay motivated and that's what science always brings, right? It, 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 there's no um, finality, like there's no end to science. There's, there's always going to be evolution. I see. Thank you so much for the answer once again. Um, Henry, I think you've got a few more questions before we wrap it up, right? Yes. And speaking about learning, uh, I'm actually very, very curious about and some advice to our listeners as well, because uh, I know it's very difficult to learn in different fields, especially to find the resources to do that. So could you explain a bit how did you uh, go about learning in different industry and how where did you find those resources or who helped you to find those resources? For myself, it's it's a lot about human connection. So it's, it's about... Uh, going out and learning from others more like I read a lot obviously but I think you can learn a lot of stuff that's not you know in books or in articles through discussions with people and I, I just I just love this human connection I love you know going to grab a beer with someone or taking a phone call or I think I I've developed a lot of relationships through the years and I kind of make links in my head if I think of something like oh uh Let's say, can I give you an example? If I have, yeah, even like the, the onboarding questionnaire that we were doing, like, a, you know, we found someone that had a bit of experience in that, and that came from a discussion I had with a friend about a certain subject. And if you kind of make those links, there's always someone who knows, um, who knows something about something specific that you're trying to learn about. So that's the first part I'd say is, you know, connect connect with people and, and ask questions. Uh, and it's genuine too. It's like, I'm interested by everyone's background and, and uh, experiences. And then the, the second part is obviously just reading, 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 like the most important thing. And I wouldn't say like, you know, read a book or anything. It's just, you know, follow the news, you know, read about, um, uh, I read I read scientific papers now and I'm like I still don't understand everything. I never wrote personally a scientific paper, so it's you know the whole structure for me was new a few a few a few years ago I'd say. But I you know now I read them and I'm like wow okay it's really cool I learn I learn a lot through that. So yeah, talk to people and and read is is the way to learn. Maybe I should say maybe I should say stay in school as well. Yeah. <laughs> Since it's well. uh, free jet. Yes, um, and we don't want any of our listeners to drop out of school for no. any good reasons. Yeah, yeah. Some final question about Ditch. So, actually, uh, what is the very long term vision for Ditch? Yeah, good question. Still, still tough for us to to answer that. I think we have obviously different projects that are maybe from, from what you know, from what is publicly known about the company right now is kind of unrelated to what we're doing. Uh, but um, we're wondering, like, you know, nicotine addiction is, is, is huge, right? There's 1.3 billion smokers in the world. I think just on that, we can build a huge company. 
just that is a very, very ambitious vision, you know, trying to solve the biggest and most important uh, public health issue in the world. I think it's, it's that, that, that in itself could be a vision, but I'm, my answer is more like we're thinking of like, can we extend that to even like broader horizons? Can we go to like something even more important in terms of, 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 uh, of, of something related to, 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 to medicine? Like, uh, you know, what we're doing is, is we're building innovative devices. We're building software. Uh, our devices collect data. We build artificial intelligence. You know, that in itself could be replicated for other very important problems, health problems across the world. So we'll see. Uh, weird answer. Like, I don't have a specific answer in terms of, like, what's our vision, but I think it's it's using technology to solve uh, huge prob huge intricate problems that could not be solved ten years ago uh, by by the technology standards that we had ten years ago. Okay, then actually speaking of ten years ago, actually my final question is, uh, what advice would you give yourself or any other uh, young entrepreneurs ten years ago before entering into the field of entrepreneurship? For me, it's uh, it's, it's really to trust, like trust yourself. Like it's, it's, it might be cheesy, but and start start somewhere as well. Like I I talk sometimes to, to young entrepreneurs who, quite frankly, like they come up with a project or idea, and it's not the best project or idea, and I never tell them that, <laughs> just because it doesn't matter. Like what matters is really starting. It's trusting yourself. My projects when I was 17, I look, you know, I look back at them now. I'm like, wow, that's, you know, would never been a, never been a good business, but, um, somehow they contributed to, you know, me and Medivier launching Ditch Lab. So start, do it. Don't be afraid. You know, don't be ashamed. Be passionate about your ideas, passionate about your product about your project and um, and learn, just keep on learning. Never, never settle, just keep on learning. Well, yeah, perfect. I think uh, we'll end up with that great advice uh, right there. And thank you so much for coming. And we'll leave uh, the website to teach lab down in the description to this podcast. So any listeners can go to, uh, look at it and check them out. And yeah, perfect. Thank you. Again, thank you so much for coming on and for taking your time. I know you're very busy. It was, uh, it was my pleasure. Thank you a lot for the invitation. And uh, to everyone at uh, Marianopolis, stay in school and be passionate. <laughs> thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you everyone who tuned in to listen. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we did during the interview. If you liked this episode, learned something, or just want to help out a bunch of students, please leave a review, write a comment, and share this on social media. If you are listening to this on YouTube, please subscribe and write to us in the comments. All the books and other resources recommended by the interviewee are in the podcast description slash video description depending on your platform. And depending on when you see this, you might be able to use our affiliate link to purchase them. The Marianopolis Addendum Podcast is actively seeking local sponsors here in Montreal. So if you are interested, please contact us at the email linked in the description. All the profit generated by this podcast will go back to fund our club's activity. If we have any surplus, they will be donated at the end of every month to a local charity. This episode was edited by Lucy Ann. And the artwork is done by Camilla Huang. The producers and guests associated with this episode may express their opinion, but this podcast does not support any political parties. We only aim to bring different perspectives on different issues through the free exchange of opinions and ideas. We look forward to seeing you at our next broadcast. Cheers!